Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Enterprise Linux Security Podcast, episode number 17. And this time, as always, I'm with Zhao. How are you doing? All good, Jay. As usual, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It really is. And we have actually two things to talk about today because, um, you know, we are, I think it was the last episode we were talking about how we always have, uh, you know, we could do this every day pretty much and <laughs> probably have something to talk about. And we have two. CVEs to discuss today. One is, you know, about Policy Kit, and the other is about Lux, the uh, popular right. encryption utility. There, so we're going to talk about both of these. And um, the, this is basically breaking news because this is just making the rounds right now as we're talking. So breaking news. Always wanted to do that, and I get my chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's talk about it. Yeah, uh, they're breaking news, and both of them are actually pretty serious. Um, as we were discussing just before we started recording, uh, they were both announced. Uh, actually, the CVE numbers for them were requested late last year, and they were only fully disclosed uh, during January. So in the past days, and Lux, I believe it was last week, as we are recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, they both pretty much uh, are very serious, and you should be really quickly in deploying the patches that are available for your systems to them. Yep. So the first one we're going to talk about is the Policy Kit CVE, which was designated 2021-4034. We'll have links in the description below, wherever you're getting this from, if you want to read along uh, with these uh, vulnerabilities. So the Policy Kit, let's start with that one. So first of all, Policy Kit is a way to basically adjust permissions without giving permissions for the entire system. So if you wanted someone to be able to access a specific command, it's it's been a very useful thing, but now I think it's going to be potentially useful for hackers. <laughs> yeah, and it's a project that's been around for 12 years now, since 2009 or something like that. And apparently in the very first commits of the code for this, uh, that commit had this flaw that uh, 12 years later was found to be vulnerable for exploitation and law now lets uh, any user escalate his own privileges to root, even if he has just uh, regular user uh, privileges in the in the system. Um, this is not remotely exploitable, as we know at this point, um, but it's uh, basically a way to escalate your privileges after you gain access to a system. Or if you're just a regular user in the system and you want to escalate your privileges to root, this is a way to achieve that. And it's actually pretty easy to do. The, the exploit itself is pretty simple. Um, basically, Polkit has an utility called PKExec that acts in a way similar to sudo. Yeah, in the Twitch, you can pass it a command to run as root, and it will let you do that. There are some policies that you can define, obviously, but still. So basically, it has an issue when it's dealing with arguments. It's possible to trick him into accepting the first argument as null, and from then on, it will treat. It's actually a bit more convoluted than this. The actual technical details are very interesting here. Um, in memory, when pkexec is running, it um, it aligns the memory in such a way that the arguments are right before the environment variables for that process. Mm -hmm. So if you pass it a null in the first parameter, it will then consider the environment variables as being that parameter. So there is a, a mistake there in parameter parsing that can be exploited this way. So it basically lets you run any command as root. It, it misses any checks. As long as it's in an environment variable, it can then be, be executed as root. Which is, as I see, as I saw in the, in the exploit code that was published like three hours after this was announced, um, this is like a capture the flag code sample. It's so simple right. that it could be a capture the flag uh, situation here. Yeah, and so let's put this into perspective then, because you know, I earlier in my career I was guilty of this, where I'm like, oh gosh, that's great. Okay, so it's not remotely uh, exploitable. I can yeah. just move on with my day. Everything's fine. It's not that big of a deal. But you know, actually 
that doesn't mean that it's not important. It doesn't mean that it's not urgent because vulnerability chains are just one example of this. For mm-hmm. example, you know, we we have a you have an app user, right? So you, if you're running Apache, you, you either have an Apache two user, Debian and Ubuntu, HTTPD, CentOS, and the like. Um, so your web server is running as that app user. If if you know it's common for Jira and Confluence and all those kinds of apps to have like a Jira user, so to speak, um, and so on. So that particular user has access to what that particular user has access to. So if someone is able to get into the system, let's just say as the Apache 2 user, then, okay, they can't do anything else because they're you know pretty much locked into that directory, assuming you've set it up right. And uh, they, they can't really do much except, well, actually much. I, I mean, they could obviously infect all the files in that directory, which would be really bad, but it's not system-wide access. But then, um, that but that's not going to save much because when a, you know, someone breaks into the system and they're, in, you know, using the system as the app user, they could use a privilege escalation attack like this one to jump mm-hmm. into root. And then they could just start installing anything anywhere they want. So, yeah, it is a big deal when someone has access to the app user because they could pretty much destroy your app. But this actually lets them level up, so to speak, and you know, yeah. take over the whole system. And that's a vulnerability chain. And then also, you know, you have, as we were discussing before, uh, we have multi user systems. So sometimes people log in and have a thing to do and um, maybe they don't have system-wide access, but, um, you know, they can get it. So this is because it's trivially exploitable. The the actual code to to exploit this is like six or seven lines long. It's really easy. It's just an exec we call with the pk exec command and then null as the first parameter as long as you set your environment variables correctly before running that you get the you get root so this is basically a free lunch um yeah. and another very interesting thing here is that this is used in basically any linux distribution in the past for the past i don't know seven eight nine years now mm-hmm. so all of them are vulnerable and all of them have been receiving patches in the the past few days that you, that should be applied yeah, I agree. And and we were talking about the reputation of open source software. And I can't remember what it said, but I saw, you know, some someone or some meme or something already, t- you know, throwing shade at open source because yet another vulnerability. But it's like they always forget that vulnerabilities are found all the time. And it's not unique between, you know, Unix, Linux, Windows, yeah, everyone yeah. has vulnerabilities. But I also kind of feel like this is going to be another one of those that they'll use as an example why open source is allegedly bad, even <laughs> though, you know, Windows has issues too. Um, so that's not good. That said, it was found in 12-year-old code, so there is something to say to the open source side of things because for 12 years, nobody actually looked at the source or at least nobody that understood the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get this in context, this isn't even the the oldest vulnerability that was found in the previous few months. Libcurl had one that was laying around for 20 years a, a few months back. So, right. yeah, the open source part of the code means that you actually need some knowledge to actually look at the source and understand it and find bugs in it. So just, it's not that the code is worse or better because of at least actually worse or better quality by being open source or not. It's just, since the source is open, people can look at it, but they need the skills to actually look at it and look for these types of issues. Uh, Being open source by itself is not a silver bullet that will save you immediately. Um, right. It doesn't make it the worse or better than closed source. That's not the the actual benefit there, but sometimes it's thrown around like it is. So yes, yes, that's such a great point because it's like, um, and I've heard people, you know, have a false sense of confidence in open source. Oh, it's open source, so it's more secure. Well, just because you can look at the code doesn't mean that someone did. Mm-hmm. And just like you were saying, if someone did look at the code. Um, you know, there's varying levels of, um, you know, skill sets here. So they could, you know, just yeah. miss it. They, oh, yeah, I looked yeah, at the code. It looks great. Um, and then they move on, right? Um, so you hope it's been audited. And if it's been audited, then you hope it's been audited by someone who's good at auditing code, um, which we don't know. Yeah. But at least we can look at mm-hmm. it if we choose to do so. Yeah. And that's a benefit in relation to closed source to it where you cannot. Um, but yeah, bugs appear in both types of, uh, of code. That's not intrinsic to either one. Yep. Um, 
And talking about the, the distributions that are affected by this, this targets all the, the major ones that are used in the enterprise and both at home. Um, the, it's the Ubuntu's, it's the Red Hat's, it's uh, all the derivatives thereof. Uh, basically, everything is um, is targeted to, by this, with the exception, with the, the single exception of Debian 12, which apparently does not let anybody run commands with a null first parameter. Because... Mm -hmm. In regular usage, the, the first parameter, arg, argc0, actually is the name of the, the, the command being called. And the way that this gets uh, triggered is by fooling the exec vcall into faking that. So Debian, Debian 12 actually has protections in place that prevent this. So I don't know if it's luck or if they were just preparing for something like this, but uh, good job on their on their end. Yeah, I don't know which it is either because Debian 12, um, that's going to be testing. So it's not, you know, final yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be because they're pulling in new libraries and new code um, from upstream in preparation mm -hmm. for the eventual Debian 12 stable. Or, yeah, maybe they're ahead of it. Maybe they knew something was happening or, you know, I yeah. don't know. But it's, either way, it's great. Yeah, it's great that it happened this way. Um, this was requested in late November last year, I believe. So there was some time in between. So I don't know, maybe the researcher guys got in touch with somebody. Um, yeah. Another interesting thing about this, it got one of those silly nicknames. It was called Pound, Ki Pound Kit or something like that, the uh, play on Paul Kit. And again, uh, the the thing with these silly names is that this distracts from other vulnerabilities without them, and it gets less publicity and all that. But the other ones can be just as important as this. Um, yep. So yeah, silly names are fun. They make for nice headlines and all that, but they are basically harming the whole industry because they yep. just shine the light on those specific vulnerabilities and the others get thrown under, under the bus. Yeah, I think uh, clickbait articles are the only thing that benefits yeah. from a title. Yeah, and probably you get new, a nice icon and a new web page just for this vulnerability, and yeah, you feel very smug. Oh boy, yeah, that's just always a fun time when we have to give something a creative name. It's almost like, you know, hurricanes in the United States are given names. I don't know if it's the same around the world or not, but you know, we give hurricanes a name because there's a finite number of hurricanes every year. But we have like new vulnerabilities every day. So if we want to start naming these things, we're going to have to name like all of them, and that's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, and it's basically useless yep. <laughs> if you have an identifier that can uniquely refer to it. Again, sure, it looks nice when when you're trying to get some clicks, but. Other than that, it's not very helpful. Right. Yep. Well, I'll just stick to the CVE number. I like that better anyway. <laughs> I'm sure people won't know exactly what you're talking about when you mention CVE number so and so, yep. but still, at least it won't make one look more important than the other just because it has a silly name. Maybe we should just start naming bugs, right? Like a bug that really drives us crazy on our Linux desktop that we want fixed, but isn't really a priority. So we'll just give it like a dumb name and then put it in the news. And then all of a sudden our bug gets fixed because we made it trendy. I mean, <laughs> where did this end? <laughs> That's an interesting point. I'm just saying, I mean, you could, I mean, you yeah. could just put that logic on anything. There's no end to it. Hopefully uh, I didn't just start something there, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That would be something if that catch then. Um, yeah, fun times. Yeah. So yeah, that's Polkit. Um, again, this is widespread. This affects basically any distro. So if you're a sysadmin, if you have Linux systems under your purview, you should look at the updates for them because this will already be available. Unless, yep. of course, you're running EOL systems and then you're on your own which yep, is something you, we'll get back to probably after we discuss the next vulnerability because it will have the same impact there. Exactly. Yeah, we will need to get back and talk about that topic there. Um, so Lux encryption, um, Linux unified key setup, I believe. Yep. And I've been using it for a very, very long time. Um, so long, in fact, I remember that there was a time where you were setting up a new Linux desktop or server or whatever, and you had to really have this thought, like, is this a really good processor? Because as soon as I enable encryption, it's going to be slower and it's just performance isn't all that good. But that hasn't been a problem for a long time because, um, you know, the 
processors and everything have gone um, gone up. And it's not something we think about anymore. It's like, yes, in, on my end, I, I encrypt everything. I don't even think about it. It's like I check the box. Why not? It's there. It's free. It's built in. Mm -hmm. um, desktop servers, why not? It, it works well. And... Um, well, I mean, yeah, it works well until we find something that doesn't. The um, whole thought process is that to, um, you know, mathematically break this encryption is just going to take a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. But what if there was a vulnerability that made it a lot easier to um, unencrypt an encrypted device? And that's what we're going to talk about. But for those that don't already know, I'm talking about, you know, full disk encryption, which has been... Uh, I think most, if not all Linux distributions that are noteworthy mm -hmm. have this option when you install them that you can check the box and have that disk encrypted, or you can even add a disk later on and encrypt that. Um, if you'd like, you can encrypt your backup hard drives that you attach to your server. Um, and you just type in the key when you mount it. I mean, there's just a lot of, of use for this. And the idea being that it's encryption at rest. So if someone steals your computer or your backup hard drive, I mean, until now, we were like, well, it sucks that they took my hard drive, but it's encrypted, so I'm okay. I'll just have to go buy another one or something. But now we, we have a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. And even for laptops with sensitive information, most companies will issue laptops to their employees and they'll store their company documents there and all that. So if you're encrypting your disk, even if it gets stolen, the attacker won't be able to actually look at the data and look at the confidential information there because it's encrypted and it's really tough to break this. And again, it's mm -hmm. mathematically infeasible to do this with the proper algorithms in place. Um, Anyway, this is intended for, like you said, uh, data at rest, for protecting data that's not uh, actually alive. And it has a series of facilities that it gives the user, and among them is the ability to change the, the actual passphrase used for encrypting a volume or a device. So, the, And it's called um, online re-encryption. It's the name of the facility where the bug was found. Mm -hmm. So it appears that it's possible to trigger that behavior without knowing the password that's in place now and asking him to re-encrypt it to a different one and then have that that um, Lux uh, utility fail in a way that part of the information has already been decrypted and is accessible. And through this process, repeating this, you can actually get the whole data on the device. It's a long process, it's tedious, but if you are going to the hassle of actually stealing a hard drive or something like that, then you will really want to get to the data. So. Yeah, for a pro properly motivated attacker, this is not an issue. Um, and this is a way to actually break encryption without requiring you to know the, the key in place at the moment. And this is and... really <laughs> and this is really tough for, for a company because basically their information that's sitting on hard disks right now can be accessed without them knowing. So yeah. That is so, I mean, depending on how you look at this, it might not seem like a big deal, but it really is because data at rest, like you were saying, that's the whole reason that this is done. Um, yeah. Obviously, if if your laptop is encrypted and it's already booted up and you're working on a document and then you get up to go grab a sandwich or something and you forget to lock your screen, encryption is not going to help you because the data is not at rest. It's mm -hmm. open, right? So um, that's not what it protects from. But if um, you know someone takes your hard drive or they try to use a live image or something to read it, they can't because it's encrypted. And that's a you know available peace of mind for a lot of uh, people in business and even personal users. They don't want their uh, budget document to get leaked out or whatever. Um, but that, that's a peace of mind because, well, you know, if it gets stolen, I'm, I'm okay because it's encrypted. And now um, that's a pretty serious um, thing to lose. And I just can't imagine the logic about um, if I'm understanding this correctly, starting to unencrypt data before it verifies the password. It's like, I understand about being proactive, but I don't really think I want my encryption solution to be proactive in that way. Well, from my understanding of the, the issue there is that it's already an encrypted. Um, actually, that doesn't make any sense. So sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, starting the re-encryption without asking you for the current uh, password there, that's a major issue. And right. it shouldn't be possible anyway. How the hell do they manage to decrypt the, the information without having that passphrase in the first place? But apparently, right. it's what's possible to do with uh, with this bug. So yeah, it's really wow. nasty. Hypothetically, you know, because I didn't have a chance to look at the exploit code yet, 
But I would imagine as tedious as this is to unencrypt a, I mean, it's just like a for loop, right? Um, <laughs> just, just, keep trying, just have a for loop and just keep trying to set the password over and over again. Next thing you know, the whole thing is pretty much unencrypted. Yeah. So depending on yeah. um, how, sometimes it's not so much the vulnerability, uh, it is the vulnerability, but it's how it's used and how creative the person that is that wants to utilize that. And we have a lot of creative people in the hacking community out there that uh, are very good at this kind of thing. So already it's like um, a, a really big deal because, you know, company trade secrets, like you were saying, could be on a laptop or an external hard drive that they yeah. ship off site or something like that. And now they, they, they're People are probably scrambling. Uh, go grab that hard drive from from over there, and and we need it back. We need to do whatever we need to do to fix this. Yeah. Um, that's a big deal. So yeah, uh, again, there are patches for crypt setup. It's the name of the package. So if you have uh, updates for that in your distribution, do apply them. This is important. Right, and hypothetically, I mean, what's stopping someone from vulnerability chaining these two CVEs that we're bringing up today, if you think about it, because, <laughs> you know, you're going to need root access to start the process of unencrypting the disk, if I remember correctly, yeah. and you could get root access by getting in as the app user and then, <laughs> you know, push yourself up to root and then unencrypt the hard drive. So not only um, can you, yeah. you know, infect the machine, you can unencrypt it and get the data too. Wow, uh, that's yeah. uh, really bad. Yeah, both of them are really bad. And again, yeah. people are, can get tired and actually feel numb with so many vulnerabilities in so little time and everybody crying wolf all the time that hey, it's dangerous and you need to patch and all that. But you really do. <laughs> this, yes. There's not two ways to look at this. You really need to pay attention to this and you really need to, to patch on time. Um, both of these are really dangerous for the, the enterprise side of things. Um, especially the enterprise side of things that depend on encryption and depend on people not being able to escalate their own privileges all uh, basically at will. So yeah, these are the types of things that get uh, IT teams uh, um, really in a, a panicked mindset. It really is. And I, I need to do some more research, especially on the Lux uh, issue that we have here, because you know, normally we think of, and maybe it is just a matter of patching, so I'd like you to share your opinion on this if you have one, but you know, you're patching the system, right, where the, that the disk is inside of, uh, which mm -hmm. is great. But if someone takes that disk out of the server, puts it in an enclosure and attaches it to a yeah, another yeah. Linux system that has not been patched yet, then yeah. I would think that would mean that even though you patched your system, that there's still an issue here if someone uses the bug on an unpatched system to break into the encryption, which would be another worry. So is that a, is, is, is my worry about that uh, well-placed or? Um, actually, before we started recording, I was in that uh, mindset there, but uh, since talking about this right now, that doesn't make as much sense. So we might be mm. mistaken here, but still it might need to be started on the actual system where the data is. So there is right. that. And that's okay. why it's possible to do this. And this way it makes more sense how this is exploitable. Because like you said, if it was different, then it would be really tricky to actually start the decryption process without having the, the private key there. But again, even right. starting it on that same on that same system, this is very, very <laughs> weird. And it's amazing that people got to, to find this bug. Because think about this. You're starting to unencrypt data on what the, should be a secure algorithm for encryption that requires a private key, and you're not supplying that private key. So Lux, at some point in the process, is storing that private key somewhere that it can still uh, access so that it uses without asking the user. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't do that. It really shouldn't be doing that. And again, this is not the only facility for encrypting data on Linux. There are file systems that can do that on the fly, but you're not doing it at the device level. You're doing it at the file system level when you're doing it on, I don't know, ZFS or something like that. Um, but um, yeah, this goes at a deeper layer and most companies prefer this to the file system one because then you can use whatever file system you want on top of, the, of a Lux encrypted device. Yep. And um, yeah, so this is probably something we'll, I imagine, probably come back to um, because it's yeah. going to be some more information about this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it might even get worse. I hope it doesn't um, as they find new avenues to infect these. But then 
we brought up the fact earlier that these were discovered in 2021 and it's now 2022 and yeah. something really important happened at the end of December when it comes to enterprise yeah. Linux. Yeah, uh, on December 31st, uh, CentOS 8 went to end of life. So the way it works right now is that these vulnerabilities get no patches for CentOS 8. So if you're a sysadmin, if your company is still running CentOS 8 because you haven't migrated away from it, well, you're in an unenviable position right now and you have some work ahead of you. You right. either migrate right now or you're going to have to start compiling this, these applications yourself and you have to deploy them yourself. And the thing with compiling your own is that the actual source code makes no allowances for specific distributions. So things like library locations and binary locations and all that will be different when you compile it yourself than the one that comes prepackaged by your distribution vendor. So it's a fun place to be there when you're trying to replace one with the other, because more often than not, you're going to end up with two binaries in different places, and then you're going to be dealing with pass issues all, all over right. the place, and libraries will be pulling one instead of the other and all that. It's not a fun thing to do. So you're out of support, you're out of update packages, and you're I wouldn't want to be in that position. No, but yeah, you know, the thing is we keep bringing this up. Why do we keep bringing up patching? Why do we keep bringing up end of life distributions and operating systems? Well, because it's an actual problem that yeah. keeps happening and people will get numb to this. And it's sad because it's so important. Um, when we say update, we mean it. And if there's a bug out there, if it happens mm -hmm. where everyone's going crazy, this is the worst security thing ever. And we don't agree in that case where it's like not that bad and people are blowing it out of proportion. We'll let you know, but that's not, the case here because we have some, you know, real possibilities that I thought of off the top of my head that, that could, you know, mm -hmm. make these um, happen. But then there, you know, hackers are more creative than I am about this. So believe me, if there's a way to um, get it, use these to get into the system, they're going to do it. And, you and need more motivated and yep. more motivated than us to look for ways to use this. So, yeah. Yep. Um, prepare yourself to start hearing about, uh, I don't know, some new ransomware that is starting to be deployed through this type of um, of things and starts encrypting devices that uh, you wouldn't expect them to. Right. And remember that, for example, Polkit, Polkit is deployed on embedded devices everywhere. And those will need new firmwares as well. Uh, things running Linux on, I don't know, toasters or printers or something like that that haven't seen an update in years, they will need an update now. <laughs> and, wow, yeah. that's crazy. You just go to make toast one morning and your toaster's like, I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just finish my, these Bitcoins and then I'll get to your toast. Yeah. Wow, that is just crazy. So um, we'll have the CVE numbers in the description yeah. be, you know, below, but uh, the policy kit, or I, I keep saying policy kit. I know I'm supposed to say Paul kit before anyone writes in. Um, yeah. Old habits die hard. I still call you know the KDE desktop KDE when I'm supposed to call it plasma, but it's a thing, right? So <laughs> those CVE numbers, we have 2021, yeah. 4034 for policy kit. Uh, there I go again, Paul kit. Yeah. Um, the Lux encryption, we have 2021, 4122. Do you know why the yeah. name changed? Was they that? actually introduced uh, breaking changes in the code, so they changed the name so that people wouldn't just update the package. When they changed to the differently named package, they knew that they were getting breaking changes and they had to change things on their system, not just update. It was that intentional. Is... Alrighty then, I, did, I actually didn't know that. Wow, that's yeah, it was uh, intentional. It was a name change, wow, it was more than that, yeah. more than that then. Yeah, it was actually intentional. Wow, uh, that's that's one way to do it. So, um, any other thoughts we have on these? Because I feel like there's so much more we can say, but there's also so much more that can we're going to learn as we navigate this, just like previous uh, vulnerabilities. Yeah, th there will be more that we want to to talk about, especially the Lux one. Actually, talking about this one out loud <laughs> right now, I've actually written about it. Uh, just a couple of days ago, and I hadn't considered those those aspects there. It's really interesting how they start the, the decryption without asking for that passphrase, and it's possible to start that process that way, and it actually gets data and encrypted that way. And thinking about that, the implications there are just massive. So we're probably going to revisit this in the future. 
And uh, just as a closing remark, and because we're talking about CVEs, uh, yeah, Lock4j just continues to give more more and more news around it. So if you thought that it was already in the past, it's not. There are new variants around. Um, it's affecting new versions of Log4j, even the ones that were already patched. And uh, yeah, uh, keep an eye out for that one. You will still continue to receive updates for it. And install those updates for sure. And yeah. um, you know, we're only 27 days into the new year. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, uh, you know, and it's <laughs> like, you know, yeah, these things started last year, so I can't technically count these as new things this year, but I also can because they've changed as of this year, and they're going yeah. to continue to do so. So yeah. if I didn't know any better, I would say we, we're not going to have any shortage of things to talk about this year. No, vulnerabilities are in, in full speed mode, so yeah, we'll continue to have them. And if you're, like we just talked about, if you're running an EOL system, uh, try to find somebody that provides the support. Um, my company does, Duxcare does, we provide you with support for CentOS 8. Even if your system is no longer EOL, you will still receive those updates from us. If not us, then someone else, but do find someone to help you out with this because it's important. If you want to keep running those systems, if for some reason you haven't updated, and there must be a reason because after so long after the Red Hat announcement, you should have already migrated away. So there must be a reason why you're keeping those systems around. Right. Do find a way to to get those updates and in some practical way that doesn't make you actually have to compile them yourselves and get those mm -hmm. systems protected. Uh, if you let them be be exploited, then it's just a stepping stone to the other systems in your infrastructure and you don't want that. Exactly. And don't if you are going to, even though we don't want you to compile it yourself, if that's what you really want to do, um, understand that you're also going to have to keep up on it because this is changing. So if you did today, for example, patch it yourself, then who's to say that it's not going to change tomorrow and that patch is no longer going to cover every scenario, um, which is why you probably would or should have, you know, a company that can help you with that that's keeping an eye on that or mm -hmm. upgrade your distro. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. What are you waiting for? <laughs> like migrate. It's easy, right? I wish it was. Um, it's actually easy. There, there are tools that help you migrate away from CentOS 8 at this point. Uh, Alma Linux Elevate tool is one of those, but uh, there are other migration options open for you. Um, but the thing here is that, and I've experienced this in the, patch, in the past, there are sometimes reasons why you're blocked from upgrading a system, either because the application that you're running on it is not compatible with the new system that you're migrating to, or there are some quirks, or you have some old hardware that you only have drivers for this version and no more because the company went out of business, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so there are reasons for wanting to have older systems running around. It's just a matter of actually going the extra mile and getting those systems also protected because it's not just the the protection and the the exploits and the risks and the new cvs that come up every other day it's not just these ones that you have to compile for it's the new ones that will show up tomorrow and the day after that it's also compliance reasons and for the enterprise this is really important if you're in an industry that has standards and has compliance requirements uh, the moment you stop receiving updates and security patches for one of your systems, then you're going to be out of compliance. And that's just very serious in the enterprise. Right. That is extremely serious. So we're going to mention it again and again, patch and migrate yeah. if you have to. Yeah. It's really serious. Really serious. And it's only going to get worse. This is the beginning of the year, right? We're just getting started for 2022. Um, I'm going to be curious to look back, you know, at, you know, in December of this year about how the year is gone. Um, if it's anything like this, I, I think I have a feeling about what it's going to be like. If you look at the trend of uh, CVEs per year on the past five years, it has always been going up at an increasing rate. And there's no reason why it shouldn't. There's more people looking at the code. There's more bugs yep. being found, more money being spent in both in security and in the ransomware industry. So the attackers also have a bigger incentive to actually find these type of things. So yeah, this will only speed up. That's true. Well, we'll be covering this as it unfolds and whatever else unfolds, we'll be covering that too. Um, so there you go, two CVEs in one podcast, a little bit of breaking news that's still <laughs> breaking and will continue to be breaking for at least several weeks, if not longer. Yeah, we won't have any shortage of this. <laughs>
Yep. It's a good, good day and age for a security podcast, I would say. So, all right. Well, there you go. So thank you guys for checking out this podcast, listening and subscribing. Um, if you're on YouTube, click the like button, um, you know, throw us a review or tell your friends or or whatever to help spread the podcast, because if this podcast is awesome, if I do say so myself. And um, we look forward to more episodes, which will definitely be coming very soon. And um, as always, I'm Jay. I'm Joel. And thank Thanks you for everybody. listening. Yeah. Thank you.